All right, we'll give it another minute to get everyone logged in and then we'll pass it off to our presenters. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Before I hand it over to our presenters today, just a few announcements for you. All of the phone lines have been muted, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box located on your menu bar, or you can use the chat feature. We'll do our best to answer all of our questions uh, during the presentation, but if we can't answer your questions, we will answer them after the webinar um, during a private session via email. Just a reminder that this webinar is not worth a CPE credit and we are recording and we'll post this to the I Bailey YouTube page and the HMWC website and our special guest will tell you about her later. We'll post it to her website as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Art, take it away. Thank you, Amy, and welcome everybody. Happy Friday um, to everyone in um, wherever you're watching this. Um, and we have a great, great webinar for you today. Very excited. Um, uh, our guest, uh, with our guest today, um, who is uh, uh, Jennifer Cavalieri from uh, Fortune Management. Uh, she is the Chief Strategy Officer. Hi, Jennifer. How are you doing? Doing great, Art. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, yeah, and she's got an absolutely killer PowerPoint presentation and great information. Jennifer is with Fortune Management. Fortune Management is the, 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 um, the largest dental management uh, company in the United States. They work with well over a thousand dentists. And um, what we're doing now is, is we were, you know, every week we were presenting to you about, you know, PPP and PPP. And, and I, there were, it's like when I had a, a word that had the letter P in it, I didn't even want to say it because I was so sick of saying it's something with a letter P in it. So we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the updates, Scott and I, um, uh, to, to do this. Uh, and we're going to go over uh, today we're going to go over a little bit of some new information on the forgiveness, the new EZ forgiveness form. We're not going to go through all the rules. We're just going to kind of give you some updates as to what you need to be looking at, some updates on idle loans, a new hopefully small business tax credit, and then we're going to turn it over to Jennifer. We have with us Scott Haberman. Scott is a partner at Ide Bailey in their uh, dental division in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. How are you doing, Scott? Doing good, Art. It's good to be here again. Yep, we're here again. And uh, Megan Mortimer, who is the congressional lobbyist and my new bestest friend um, from the American Dental Association is with us. Uh, hi, Megan, how are you? I'm doing good, Art. Good nothing, to see you again. Nothing, nothing from SBA this morning, right? We didn't have to go <laughs> slam this PowerPoint and tell Jennifer to come back in two weeks, right? That's nice. No, I only refreshed the page five times today, which is a new look <laughs> for me. There you go. So again, that's going to be uh, the four of us are going to be on today. So let's get right to the get the some of the PPP stuff. And again, we're going to talk about forgiveness and some additional guidance, uh, the new application, uh, the EIDL loan. So let, let's go to the next slide, uh, Amy. So uh, they came out with some additional guidance uh, on uh, was it was it Monday, Megan? Monday or Tuesday? I think it was Monday night. Uh, Okay. It was Monday night, okay. right? Because I had a because I had to spend all day Tuesday revising a PowerPoint for a presentation we did on Tuesday. So as you remember, um, they they the the law passed on the fifth of June, the new uh, Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act. So now you are allowed to pay employees because it's twenty four weeks, not owners, but employees, a maximum of forty six thousand. $154 using PPP money, which is really going to be a non-issue as we've talked about in the past. But if you have fewer employees, your practice didn't come back as well, you have that option now to go to the $46,154 as well as retirement, health, and state unemployment taxes. But again, we, we don't think for most of the practices that's going to be an option, only if you reduced your number of employees. Scott, you haven't seen any of that need with with the new rules right uh so yeah it seems like the big factor now we don't really need to track utilities or really any other expenses other than payroll because uh, i think most folks will be able to qualify with that 
that new larger amount for all their employees. Right. And then what they also did in this guidance is they basically, you know, they, they didn't want to increase the owner amount to the 46,154. What they decided was, and this is SBA, this is not in the law anywhere. This is an SBA edict, right, Megan? This is, was, was they were going to, it was that the owner could, could take out and have forgiven $15,385. That is now technically 20,833, which is two and a half months. At the end of the day, folks, here's the deal. You got two and a half months worth of money. You're going to have five and a half months to spend it. Some of you four and a half if you kept it for a month. You're going to spend, if you got a $100,000 PPP loan, you're going to spend it on payroll. It, it's that simple. It doesn't matter how much it goes to the owner. It doesn't matter how much goes to the assistant or the hygienist. You're going to spend it on payroll. But just be aware that that's the case. Um, uh, if you could, uh, Amy, put up the 24-week spreadsheet just to show you, and we will have this up on our website. Um, I haven't put the HMWCI belly name on it yet, but uh, if you could put that. Yeah, so this is, if you remember, we were, this was for the Wiederman and Mortimer dental practice because Megan Megan wanted to be part of a dental group. So Sorry, Scott, party. you got demoted and I okay. now part of the group. Yeah, You're more you qualified than me. You snooze, you lose, buddy. Anyway, so so this just basically takes this out 24 weeks. All you want to make sure that you do is that you fill this out for 24 weeks. And if you want to, if you pay twice a month uh, or every two weeks, just make sure that you're at 60% of payroll costs. Virtually every one of you is going to be at over 100, 150%, 200%. I did one at 220% yesterday. But just make sure you're there. Don't do anything silly. Don't do anything funny. Don't put grandma and, and, and Uncle Ned on the payroll. Uh, don't put the dog on the payroll. Just pay your payroll. And when we go to do the forgiveness, that's, that's going to be it. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint, if you would, please. And again, we'll have that available to you if you want it. Um, all right, so let's go to the next slide. So the application. So it, it basically, if you could also now, uh, Amy, put up the application form. Uh, they came out with a new, two new applications. They came out with a form 3508, which I'm not putting up on the screen. And they came out with a new EZ form, okay? And this is only three pages. If you remember the last form they came out with was 11 pages and it was a beast. And you needed Advil and other things to keep you from your head exploding. So now it's a lot easier. So you will be, you, we believe, Megan, that most dentists will be able to use this form, right? Yeah. I, in looking and talking to all of our dentists and, you know, you talking to your clients and how they're able to spend this money on payroll, I really think that most dentists will be able to use this. Again, like I told you, I think that the other longer application is gonna be for restaurants and other businesses that have a hard time hitting the 60% pay payroll threshold. So at, at the so let's just scroll down. It, it tells you to put in your payroll schedule, your employees. And, and if you look at the instructions, which I didn't put up here, it, it asks you, go towards the top again a little bit, Amy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so if you see, um, it says there, employees at time of loan application, employees at time of forgiveness application. So if you look at the instructions, it says, put down how many employees you had at the time of the loan application. That's all it says. And it says, put down the number of employees you had at forgiveness. So it doesn't give you a lot of guidance on that. I don't think that's going to really matter. So let's scroll down. And the nice thing about this is that you're going to, and we'll go back to the slides in a second, you put down your payroll costs. In a lot of cases, you may not even have to put down lines two, three, and four because your payroll costs are going to be more than 100% of your loan amount. You add everything up. You put your PPP loan amount in. You take your payroll divided by 60%, which is going to give you a greater number than your payroll. So if, you, if your loan was 100000 but your payroll was $150,000, you are going to end up with $100,000 of forgiveness. So let's scroll down a little more. And they, they basically, you're, you're representing all of these things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it. Um, and, but, but, but down at the bottom here where it says, in addition, the authorized representative of the borrower must certify by initialing one of these. 
that it either says you didn't reduce the number of employees or the average hours between January and the end of your covered period. And for most of you, your covered period is going to be sometime end of September to the middle of October. Um, you know, we, we don't think you're going to check that box. We do think you're going to check the second box, which is going to say that the borrower was unable to operate between February 15th and the end of the covered period at the same business activity level as before February 15th because of things that OSHA, HHS, or um, uh, CDC did, and you had to do sanitation and social distancing. Um, and, 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 and we think that the box number two, I think, Megan, is what most folks are going to end up checking. Yeah, CDC mandated them to do certain kinds of PPE, and it's actually not even mandated. In here, it says guidance. So even if it wasn't mandated by CDC, if, if they provided guidance to dentists saying this is the kind of PPE you need and the practices you need to follow, they're totally fine, and this is the box they would check. Right. And then the third page, I think, is just some survey stuff. I don't even think. Um, let's go down one more, uh, Amy. Go down further. This is just for data points for Treasury. Um, they want to know if the borrowers are veterans. You know, just kind of. There's lot, been lots of questions about whether or not this is getting to certain populations and uh, or people in certain populations are applying. So this is just kind of a data point for Treasury to kind of report to Congress. Okay. So let great. Thank you, Megan. So let's go back to the PowerPoint, please. Okay, so, so basically who can use this EZ form? Scott, I guess there's three different groups that we can have. Uh, you have to uh, check one of these boxes. So for any of you that's a self-employed individual, independent contractor, sole proprietor uh, with no employees. So maybe, maybe a spouse has a dental practice that has employees, but maybe your spouse is a self-employed real estate agent with no employees. That person can use this form. Uh, if you didn't reduce salaries of your employees who make less than 100 grand uh, by more than 25%, and you had the same number of employees uh, on the average as of January 1, some of you might meet that test, which we hope you will. Uh, but, but basically, we think that it'll be the, the number three uh, is going to allow you to do this. So if you didn't reduce salaries of employees who make less than 100,000 by more than 25%, and you meet this rule that you were unable to operate at the same level of business activity uh, you know, after February 15th as you were before, uh, you can use this form. I cannot imagine, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Jennifer, your practices, you might blow up my problem because your practices might end up really coming back super strong. But for the most part, when a dental office is closed for eight to 10 weeks, it's very hard to say that they're at the same level of business activity during this period. So if you meet one of these rules, you can use the easy. You don't then have to do all the calculations that are required in the regular form, Megan, which is going to take forever. So obviously we're waiting. I, I, this, is, this is my broken record, Megan. We're still waiting for guidance to see what they come up with to talk about all these little nuances. But we are very hopeful that you'll be able to do this. Um, with this form. Scott, any thoughts on this? Is that kind of where we're thinking here? Yeah, I guess my concern with that third point is, uh, and I don't think they would come out and say this, but okay, does that mean that uh, reducing salaries is also reducing headcount? So if you're reducing that headcount, um, that would concern me, but I don't see that written in between the lines here. It seems pretty clear. So yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going to stick and we'll get more guidance that's beneficial for this third point to yep. apply to all of our, our all of our clients pretty much okay uh, next slide please uh, Amy and and again you have to certify one of these two things that I was showing you on the forum is that you did not reduce the number of employees or the average paid hours between January 1 and the end of the covered period other than your inability to rehire people so if someone called you up your number one hygienist said you know dr dr Mortimer I, I just can't come back. I'm afraid. I don't want to do this. Uh, I'm not going to do this. Um, or I, I, I'm going to go find another job. And you can't find another hygienist. That would cover. And there's all kinds of rules we've gone over with you in the past. Um, so there's that one. Or that you were unable to operate between February 15th and the end of the covered period at the same level of business activity. You will have to check one of those two forms in order to be able to use this uh, we think number two is a slam dunk, and we hope you can all use the form. End of story, Megan. I mean, it's really 
I mean, for now, again, I think you and I are pretty hopeful that this is pretty black and white. I, I hear Scott's concerned on the 25% reduction in salary of overall with the headcount, but I feel like it would be counterintuitive and kind of mean for them to give us a safe harbor on lowering your employee amount and then say, oh, wait, you didn't meet the 25% uh, threshold. So I think we're good. I'm hopeful. Well, and, and, and then you said mean. Mean does not usually go with Oh, there's a general election on November 3rd. Oh, did, well, you know, that's how that generally works. You, you live in Washington and more than I do. Next step, uh, next slide, please. And again, the application, the 3508, which some of you might have to use, it's four pages long. It will apply to general, generally businesses who don't meet the FTE or the 25% reduction rule. And who like, like this is like you said, for the restaurants, right? And, and the other businesses. Yeah, so, those are the ones that are really struggling to meet that 60% threshold for payroll. Yeah, and we're just saying hopefully Dennis will be able to use this and meet the test. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so let's chat about these idle loans for a little bit. So, uh, you know, a couple, several weeks ago, Scott and I brought to Megan's attention some concerns, and, and, and not only did we bring it, lots of your members at ADA have brought it. So in these idle loans that you're getting, you really need to read the loan documents. So I printed out, you see it says there are limits on distributions of assets. So it says in the loan document, I took it from one of my client's loan documents, and I'm pretty sure they're all the same. Borrower will not, without the prior written consent of SBA, make any distributions of borrower's assets or give any preferential treatment, make any advance, directly or indirectly, by way of loan, gift, bonus, or otherwise, to any owner or to any company, directly or indirectly, uh, with or controlled by borrower or any other company. I mean, and you've got to get the written consent. So we were looking at this thing and saying, Scott, do we have to get every doctor who's an S corporation to get written permission from the SBA to take a, a profit distribution from their business if they got an idle loan, right? Wasn't that the concern? Yeah, that was, that was one of the biggest concerns um, among many others that were written into the, the loan documents. And it was, it's not a short document. It's a, it's a lengthier document with a lot of legal terminology. So uh, I, I cautioned all of my folks who received uh, these, these idle loans to let's tread lightly before you sign on that dotted line. Exactly. Well, Megan had been corresponding with some people that she knows at ADA, at, at SBA. And every time I would ask Megan, she'd go, um, haven't heard anything. Well, she finally heard. And I, I took the name of the administrator out of the, um, the email, and all I did was print his answer, which basically says, we, with regards to the limit on distribution of assets section of the loan authorization agreement, this does not apply to normal business operations, including distributions to cover tax obligations, service performed, distributions of net income. Uh, pretty clear, but folks, very important. This is not advice that is in a code or regulation. It's an email from an SBA administrator. Um, you know, Scott, my, my thought would be the easiest thing to do is if you're going to use this money, we've talked about it before, take it, put it in a separate account, um, use it for overhead, use it for lab, use it for supplies, use it, um, you know, for your, 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 your dental consultant, use it for, you know, all those types of folks, um, and, 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 and don't use it to take distributions, use your other money to do that. And then they can't really even think about coming after you, right? Yeah, and look at trying to pay it back sooner than later because there are other restrictions and uh, potential for review by uh, a public accounting firm that could be required by the SBA. So there's a lot of things where if they're going to use the money, I think it says later on these slides, use it as a last resort and right. let's, let's, let's be smart about what we're using it on. Absolutely. All right, let's go to the next slide, Amy. So, so Megan and I had a conversation a couple of days ago with a dental specific lender who was talking to us about the problem is that, you know, he was saying, you know, if a doctor wants to get, because we're now getting back into the game, right? The offices are open. We're thinking that life is coming back. People are thinking about they're opening a second office. They're moving their location. They're expanding. They're buying another practice. Okay, so now this lender was saying to us, the problem is, is SBA is putting a blanket lien on all of your assets, whether there's already a lien from another bank. And the concern is, folks, and this is something that you need to talk to your bankers about. If you want to do this, you know, you're in the middle. I mean, March 15th came, you were building out a, a new location. 
you were killing it. Uh, you know, you're a client of Fortune Management. I'm sure, Jennifer, you've got clients that, were, that are expanding because of all the great stuff you guys are doing, right? You know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not only expanding, but definitely in multi locations. You know, there's a lot of dentists that haven't wanted to come back. And so it, we're helping out a lot of doctors to consolidate as well. Exactly. So, so that was a concern. So we're looking into this, Megan. I know that you're going to be talking to folks at SBA and Treasury and, uh, you know, Maybe some major league baseball players might be able to, I don't know. But anyway, the point is. As, you, as we all saw with the response on getting idle loans in the first place, it took two months as opposed to the, you know, the time frame that they gave us. So, you know, my average, you know, getting a response back from SBA is usually five days. So. Yeah. So we'll see. So, you know, our advice as Scott and I have talked about on these pod, on these webinars is, yeah, if you have other sources of liquidity, you have a line of credit, even if you have a home equity line of credit or a business line of credit. Um, go to that first, go to your sources of liquidity. This idle loan is great. The terms are great. 30 years, 3.75%, no prepayment penalty and no fees. But there are significant restrictions that you need to be aware of if you're going to go down this road. And that, that's all we wanted to point out to you. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Last thing, and then we get to Jennifer, which I'm really looking forward to. And so maybe just to jump in. Just oh, to jump ahead. in, our, I, I had a couple uh, clients actually reach out and say they got a notification that the portal is now open for idle loan applications. Yeah. And so just an FYI, that's not any kind of phishing email. It did come open again. It was only limited to agriculture type businesses in the last, I don't know, gosh, a month or so. And it's closed down to every other industry out there. But uh, I think it was end of last week or beginning of this week, they opened it back up to non-ag uh type of entities out there in the in the united states so just be aware that it is option is an option now going forward and i think the grant is available too but just know uh, like art and i have discussed on previous webinars um that idle grant uh is 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 a subtraction from your forgiveness calculation so you essentially have to pay it back anyways and one point i do want to make scott that's really important if you have not applied for a ppp loan you have until the 30th of this month. So you have a little less than two weeks. So if you're going to do, I had a new, new client yesterday. And, well, I didn't think this was a big deal. And it, it's, it's, it's a pain in the, and I said, wait a minute, doctor. I said, by waiting, you guessed right. You can get about 50 grand of, of free money. And he says, really? I said, really? So he's going to apply for it. So last thing, uh, Scott, I guess, and Megan, I guess we get a little maybe surprise here. We've been talking about this for a couple of months. Um, a couple of congressmen uh, put out this bipartisan proposal, right? Yeah, so Troy Balderson and Brenda Lawrence, um, Brenda Lawrence is from Michigan and Troy Balderson is from Ohio, um, for, you know, Republican and Democrat, there's seven other members of Congress on there, also bipartisan, have put forth a bill that would allow for a $25,000 tax credit for PPE for small businesses. Not a lot of strings attached. It uh, encompasses not only gloves and N95 masks, but any retrofitting you might have had to do or large equipment purchases that you might have had to do. Um, this has a good amount of traction in the House. We're hopeful that this will get a lot of attention. We, the ADA itself, is going to be probably submitting a letter of support next week, and then we're going to have our organized dentistry coalition of all of our different dental orgs also weigh in with a letter of their own. And then we'll go to our medical groups, specialty friends, and ask them to also weigh in to just show you know, a lot of support for this bill. This would be great. I mean, we know PPE costs are huge and we would love to have this tax credit included. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of opposition to it. So we're hopeful this might be included. I also wanna note on the June 30th date that a group of senators yesterday came out with a number of bills to improve the PPP loan program. Oh, one really? Of which, yes, one of which would expand the application <laughs> time from June 30th to December 31st for as long as there are funds still available. Um, again, they would have to do that quickly in order for this expiration date not to happen and then not them put the money back. I don't know if they're going to get that done in time. Um, but they also are really focusing on the restaurant industry as well. So they want to make sure that, you know, the restaurants, which are seeing a 50% operating loss or more in some cases would get some special attention um, in upcoming bills. So I just, I just want to let everybody know that there may be an expansion behind the June 30th date, but don't count on it um, because I don't know if Congress can get that done before then. Okay. But yeah, we're hopeful on this one for sure. This would be huge. And you and I and Scott have talked about 
how much more a credit is better than a deduction, et cetera. So, yeah. And, and just be aware, folks, it's not going to be a $25,000 tax benefit because you're not going to be able to take a deduction for the amount of money that you pay. So you'll lose the deduction, but you'll get the credit. It, it still comes out to a fifteen dollars to $18,000 money in your pocket and if they make the ppp expenses deductible for this year everybody's going to be pretty happy in april all right i want to get to jennifer because she's got such great stuff so uh if you could go to her um powerpoint uh, uh jennifer uh jennifer chevalier is the um chief strategy officer for fortune management um largest dental management company in the in the united states very, very, very outstanding company. I, I know people in the company. I know many of their 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 their, their um, consultants. You did you tell me, Jennifer? You have what, hundred, hundred fifty consultants around the country. How many do you have? We're at about one hundred and ten now. One hundred and ten. So I asked Jennifer to come on. We've been talking in the last week or two. Um, they have been working since before March fifteenth, kind of seeing where this was going. Um, to, to, to help their practices recover, because at the end of the day, you're going to get some really great information today. So let, let's start off before we go to your PowerPoint. I'm going to kind of turn this over to you, Jennifer. So as we start started getting into beginning, middle of March, um, as, as you saw where this, as you and, and, and your management team at Fortune saw where this was going, what was the 35,000 foot view as far as what you really, what, what kind of plans you put into, into place? For your for your doctors, because I know we're past a lot of that, but I want to I want to get your thought, what your thought process was. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you said, we've got 110 advisors. We oversee about a thousand practices across the country, and you know, all of them kind of looked for us as guidance. Is you know, how will I make it through this? What do I do now? Um, and we we're really fortunate to have so many people and resources that were able to come together to really design this 12 week program that we're calling the 90 day practice recovery acceleration program, because we knew it wasn't enough just to survive it. We wanted our clients to come through and really thrive through it. And, um, you know, so we saw, we saw pretty early on, we're in the seminar business. We do a lot of live events across the country, uh, close to 200 a year. And we knew, you know, talking to the hotel businesses, <laughs> looking at some of the reports from other countries, we knew that travel was going to be an issue. Um, so we pulled the plug on a couple of events pretty early on in February and in March and started to pull together all of our advisors to say, look, this is something that's going to hit everybody and we got to be prepared for it. And, you know, 2020 hindsight, I, I'm, I'm blessed that that our teams, you know, came together so much. I mean, most of our offices really just hit probably a four to six week shutdown. Um, but that was actually a blessing in disguise because they were able to get more done in that four to six weeks than they probably had all year. Uh, our coaches have been laughing because it's like, I've been begging our clients to do this, this, and this, and they just didn't get to it. And now they did. Um, so, you know, to share some of the, the stats uh, that I brought today, you know, 92% of our offices are reopened. And of that 92%, 60% of them uh, experienced 50% or more production in that first month back. And 30% of our clients are now in their second month and are reporting levels of 80% or normal. That's so, good. you know, that's really, you know, I share that to give some positive news that dentistry is well on the road to recovery. And no matter where you are in the process, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so yeah, I, I'm hoping to share some insight with where we've kind of come from in the last 90 days, we're actually in our 12th week starting on Monday. And my hope is that this information will be really relevant because it'll be seen for the, the average practice. You'll be seeing this stuff come apparent in the next week or two. And um, so hopefully we give them a head start. It's not too late, Jennifer. I mean, I no, know not at all. With your offices back when they were shut down and now, like you say, 90 plus percent of the offices are open. But, but it, it, let's give hope that it is absolutely not too late to implement some of the stuff, right? Not at all. Not at all. And I, you know, I don't think that, um, I don't think that you can look at it and say, oh, I, I wasted so much time. No, you would waste more time if you don't do something now. So obviously, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that some of it was just a waiting period and you did have to wait it out and see what happened. Um, 
but I, there's definitely, I think the biggest message, if anyone grabs across is don't sit and be reactive. This is the time to be really proactive. So everything that we're going to talk about is just taking matters into your own hands, you know, and, and hopefully that's a real giving experience to feel that I am in control because I think a lot of this whole period over the last three months felt like it was out of our control. And when it comes to your business, you're absolutely in control. And so we'll, we'll talk through some of that. Um, three areas that we really honed in on for every dentist was to identify the three roles that they have. And the first one is one of which is a leader was probably the most neglected role during this pandemic. And I think for most dentists, they say leadership is a, is a challenge for them anyway. And this probably just, you know, made that even harder. Uh, it was no different for, you know, in our country and in our communities, you heard that, oh, the lack of leadership, lack of leadership. Well, it's no different for employees and patients of a dental practice they were really looking for their doctors and it gave the doctors a golden opportunity to let their leadership skills shine. So we've been working for the last 12 weeks to really strengthen the leadership skills of each individual practice owner. The second one was really the role of the CEO, which, you know, everything you're talking about with the PPP and, you know, asking the vital questions, how do I make sure that my business is going to survive through this? How am I going to be sustainable well after this? You know, that's really the role of the CEO. How do you plan for the future? How do you execute on what I need to, to do now? Um, and then lastly was, you know, definitely the most comfortable for most doctors, which is that clinical director role. But we had to, we had to be careful of that too, because they got so, so focused on the clinical aspects that they weren't focused on the business owner portion or even the leadership that their employees really needed of them. So that was kind of the three ways we chunked it down to looking at, and every doctor, this is not just for the pandemic. This is for everything. This is for every time moving forward. You have these three hats that you wear. And if you're not in love with some of them, that's okay, but you need to be aware of it and you need to either support yourself by hiring people around you to help you with those other areas or just you know, pay some better attention to some of these other things. Yeah, and, and I see in, in a lot of these, in a lot of the offices I work with, I'm Scott sure you do too, is the, the dentist delegates the leadership role to the office manager. And that, that's dangerous, isn't it? Jennifer? Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to Scott. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely think, you know, uh, we tend to not even use the word off office manager. We try to uh, make it more about leadership because who honestly really wants to be managed? Not too many people. Um, but, you know, that can, it's, it's okay to empower people to be leaders in your practice. But I think it's really, um, it's not so good if you're neglecting or not paying attention to those things as an owner. No one's going to care about your business as well as you, right? So they have to at least be aware. I'm all for giving people empowerment and supporting them and delegating. I think delegating is fantastic. Uh, doctors wear a lot of hats and they do a lot of things themselves. So it's really important to empower your team, but be careful that you know everything that's going on too, right? Right. Um, you know, this slide on, on the, the media, it's really just to kind of paint the picture that it's up to us as the dental industry to really control the narrative. I think for a while we, we let that kind of, we sat back and we were reactive and we saw all these things coming at and, um, and it was scary and it put a lot of fear not only into our patients' mind, but our employees' minds. And so this is our time as a dental community to really come together and drown out the negativity and really empower that positive messaging. I mean, we, we've been doing campaigns in all of our offices on social media to say how safe dentistry is. And not only from the patient's perspective, but from the employee's perspective. That was number one. If you don't feel safe here, you know, you shouldn't come back to work. And so we challenged all of our owners to say, you know, what is it going to take for your employees to feel really safe? Because if they're safe, then they translate that safety to the patients. That's the internal marketing that really needs to take place right now. Um, and there is, there is no doubt that there's been a disruptive change in our business. 
uh, and how our customers, or in this case, our patients, really view coming back to the dentist. I put, the, uh, I put this theory of uh, diffusion of innovations that maybe some of you have seen before. There's a book that came out not uh, too long ago by Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. And he applied this to innovation and marketing technology, but it really strikes a nerve for any kind of change in a marketplace. And what he talks about is that when you are launching something or a re-entry into a market, you tend to only see maybe that first 15% of your demographic. So the innovators or the early adopters. And when we started to get our practices back, this is exactly what we noticed happening in the dental practices. Now, obviously they had, you know, two or three months of hygiene appointments that they were trying to squeeze in and they're trying to, to ramp up. And they also went into lower capacity because they were seeing less people and less columns of dentistry. But when we started to look at the numbers, we were seeing that, well, we've really only penetrated probably close to 15, maybe 20% of our patient population. And what one of our fears was, was there will be this chasm that until we cross that and get into the early majority of a patient base, that two things could happen. We could be in more of a cash flow crunch if we're uh, running out on PPP, and we could also be in a patient flow crunch. And so this is something not to scare everybody, but to be aware of and to not go blind into the practice. You've got to be watching these uh, you know, triggers and everything that we're going to talk about today is really how do I avoid that chasm? How do I make sure that I'm not just seeing 15 or 20 percent of my patient population and that I'm communicating extra to that early adopt or to the early majority of my practice? Um, so if you know, in an organization that survives by sales, uh, we talk about filling a sales funnel. In dentistry, we're looking at phases of influence. And this is what we're really gonna talk about today is how do you influence the rest of your patient base to come into the dental office? So this is one area that I want definitely uh, talk to Art and Scott about is you know, changing our focus. I, I heard this from a, a couple doctors that were really preparing, oh, this is going to be the worst year in dentistry. And, you know, my practice will never see so, so bad of a hit. And I had one client that said, well, I'm going to, I'm determined to make it the best year ever. And I kind of looked at him and I said, okay, it, it like took me back. And I said, well, what if we all took that thought? What if we all said, why, why not make this the best year ever? And you know, from a reason or from realistic terms, it's not the most activity top line number. They may not produce as much dentistry with that two or three month setback. But with all the resources that you guys have been talking about earlier, there's no reason why this can't actually be the most profitable year they've had. And one of those silver linings to all of this is that it forced everybody to get a little leaner. Um, it's forced everybody to be more productive. It's forced everybody to be more efficient. And so this is kind of, I think, an exciting topic is that while you may not be able to hit the numbers that you did last year in top line, uh, we're already seeing our practices grow in what they're actually sending the bottom line, which for them owners, I think is a very exciting topic. Maybe you have this, sir? I, 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 I missed the last thing, Jennifer. It kind of faded in a little bit. Could you ask that again, please? Is there anything that you would add? I mean, is it realistic to say that some of our practices could actually uh, see m higher profitability this year with some of the assistance they're getting from PPP and you know maybe not bringing back so many employees? Um, they could actually be sending more to the bottom line than they ever have. If we can get practices, Jennifer, back to... 70, 80% of what they were doing. Uh, we're going to lose the lab and supply costs. We may not be bringing everybody back. What I've been seeing in some of the cash flow modeling that I've done for some of my clients, obviously, Scott, I'd love to get your input too, is that you know, for a doctor that's doing a million dollars, a million and a half, they might be down fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 in profit, maybe from where they were last year. And if someone said to me, we're gonna shut down the United States economy and we're going to um, 
we're only going to have to find $75,000 to be where we were at or better. And obviously, if you're working with a coach like someone from Fortune Management, I suspect some of these people are going to be maybe back to where they were, maybe a little better. I would be very, very happy. So yes, I, I don't think that you know people, uh, I, I think they're, they're all looking at saying, we've got to do better, we've got to do better. And that's where the leadership is so critical. Because if the dentist says, listen, guys, we understand we're shut down for eight weeks, but we can make some of this up. And, and maybe we expand some hours, or maybe we do this, or maybe we do that. Then, then they can get back. So it's not like doctors, you're going to lose a quarter of a million dollars and you're going to have to go, go mortgage your, all the equity in your house to make it through this. Not at all. So I, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 And I mean, you take a million dollar practice, you know, if they increase their profitability by 5%, that's 50 grand that goes to the bottom line. So yeah. for most of our practices, I mean, this PPP has been a, an unbelievable gift, especially yeah. for the doctors that are, you know, back in operating now and seeing numbers between 50 and 80%. Um, it's been amazing. So, you know, I think it's all with what you do with it and how you look at it and mindset comes into play uh, really hugely here. Um, so we took a look at, you know, the, when we're talking about the numbers, there's three things that we're looking at as an organization. One, the benchmark. So it's really important to know what were we at before. Um, and then looking at the leading indicators, which are things that are going to actually uh, cause change or cause the other metrics to uh, make an impact. And then our accelerators are how do we speed everything up or how do we make it grow faster? And so these are just things that, that we're looking at, you know, and we encourage all of our CEO doctors to look at these things, you know, look at your total adjusted production, look at your net collections, look at your net earnings and compare them with your 2019 numbers. Uh, it's really important. We kind of said at, at this time, it's, uh, it's kind of half time, right? So you are, should be doing a mid-year review of maybe where your annual plan has changed. So that's a really important exercise that we do with all of our clients is we do an annual plan in the fall for the next year. And we create a whole new business plan. And obviously, most of it got turned up on its head with this whole pandemic, but it doesn't mean we throw it all out. It just means that if this, then that. So if we know what our numbers are now, and we know what we have to do to accelerate certain ones, we know where the gap is. And if we coach our doctors to say, look, this is what it would take to get the numbers that we wanted, then it's the team's decision you know, are we going for it? And we've had really little uh, resistance to plans that are created by the team. And when they're a part of these number making processes, you know, it's important for the CEO to kind of illustrate it all, but it's also really important for the team to buy in and to know what's in it for them. So bonus programs are more important now than ever. And some dentists are probably looking saying, bonus programs, I can't even, you know, make my numbers. But that's not, everyone's got to have some kind of incentive. And I think what we're seeing is that employees are actually willing to work harder and better than they ever have. I think they're grateful to have a job um, and they're grateful to be back. So, you know, utilizing that, but not to a disadvantage where you forget that, you know, everybody's motivated by something. Um, some of these le leadering indicators that we call them, you know, looking at your capacity. So your schedule utilization, what we found in the, the first four weeks back is people forgot going back to basics. We talk about scheduling the goal. It's really important that you don't just throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. You know, that's what causes doctors to have $7,000 days and then $700 days the next. We like to kind of spread it all out and have a target that they plan to hit every single day. And as scheduling coordinators or people that work the schedule, they need a really set target to know how many and what procedures to do every day. And what happened in the four weeks is they were so excited to get back. They were so preoccupied with the PPE and, you know, all these different um, Ster you know, sterilization protocols and, and everything like that, that they really were just filling the schedule to fill the schedule. And it wasn't necessarily with an emphasis oh, on productivity. Yeah. So, you know, looking at what your capacity is, is really important. Looking also out that, you know, if pra practices were shut down March, April, and May, or some of May, 
those six month recall patients that are now due September, October, November were not scheduled forward. So it's important, we don't, we'll use transformational vocabulary, we won't call them holes, but more as opportunities. It's important that they look out to the fall and identify exactly how many opportunities they have in the schedule. And I don't care if it's 200, 300, put a number on it, and then get your team to identify all the eligible patients that could be filled for that segment. And every week we're tracking that. If it started at 200 and we got 10 on the schedule filled this week, we're gonna celebrate that win this week. And that's how by hopefully in four to six to eight weeks, that schedule for September, October, November is full. Um, so, I hear a lot of practice. Yeah, go ahead, Art. I was gonna ask you, Jennifer. So we've had some practices who have come and we've been talking about, well, you know, what about if we have all of these hygiene appointments that weren't made because the office was closed? What about opening up on a Saturday? What about opening up on a Friday? What about opening up maybe an extra hour a day? I mean, we got to look at paying overtime and things like that. How do you feel about that? Have you talked to your offices about things like that? I think they're all fantastic uh, strategies that resourceful practices are going to look at. And I think that's really important in this time is that you have to look at everything that's available. Everything's on the table. And then as a team, you decide what are we going to do? Because it, it's not just a dictatorship. It should be, you know, a team that comes together and actually do the work. They should have some gain. So for me, it's looking at space and at extra you know, uh, time. I think it's fantastic. Jennifer, so, you're really breaking up. Oh, shoot. Okay, um, I can call in. Is it any better? I mean, right now it is, yes, but we did not really understand what you were just saying. Oh, shoot, okay. Let me see. Uh, all right, let me know one more time. If it okay. gets to be bad, good. let me know. For now you're Okay. Good. You want me to stop uh, my video? Sometimes that helps with these calls. I can do that. Sure, that'd be fine. Oh, thanks, Megan. Um, so definitely, I think looking at all the resources, Art, that you were talking about, adding days and things like that, that's all really, really important. Um, so some of these other leading, leading indicators, hygiene patients seen, restorative patients seen, adjusted production per hygiene visit, adjusted production per restorative visit, you know, these come into play a lot with our um, insurance-based practices, you know, they have to be scheduling on real numbers, not just the inflated UCR fees. Nice. Um, adjusted hourly production by provider. This is something that should, it should be cognizant. You know, if you're taking more time with every patient, you know, it's your production per hour is going to go down. So, you know, utilizing assistance, utilizing other areas in the practice. Uh, maybe you have another operatory to seat patients. You've got to, you got to look at that. Um, I was going to ask you, Jennifer, and maybe you're going to get into this in a, a, a later slide. What, what is this a time to look at if you are contracting with insurance companies where, where you, you and I both have the same, you know, com that's a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, is it, are you starting to have the conversation with doctors about, do we want to start looking at some of these not well paying PPO plans? Is it time to start looking at going out of network? Is it starting to have the conversation? Maybe this was a good catalyst to do it. Yep. I think they can make a good argument. I think it's uh, like a conversation we were having earlier. It's a very uh, personal decision. It's also a, a conversation that should be had all the time. I think everyone should be evaluating their relationships with payers all the time because it constantly changes and it's not a one size fits all. I think that with any kind of change that the entire country is or world is going through, that throwing more change in now is probably, you know, somewhat okay. But you've got to look at each, you know, having a valuation done on your practice to determine you know, what is my reimbursement schedule here? How many patients do I have on this plan? And does this make sense to go out of network? That takes a lot of manual effort, a lot of manual hours to do. And that's why we say that's a constant process. It's not something that you just decide to do and, you know, do it once. 
Um, so we are seeing some of our, our practices definitely take that into consideration, put that more on the priority list to say, look, you know, these are plans that historically we don't have a ton of patients in and the patients that we do, they're just, they're not our quality patients. Um, so you need to look at that. And, you know, this is definitely a time if you don't have a dental in-house membership plan, this is absolutely a time that you need to have that because you've got to offer your patients solutions. Um, we know with unemployment also some of our patients, some of our great patients are losing their dental insurance. And so, you know, this is, goes back to communication. Pull your, pull your patients, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them to see, you know, how how lucrative is it for me to stay in that plan? But I think that it, it's a reality for a lot of dentists to be reevaluating their relationships well, with their party. And payers. the one thing I want to point out, because I, I am a big fan of reevaluating participation in discounted dental. I'm not talking about in-house membership. I'm talking about uh, insurance contracted PPOs. But I know that you guys teach the dentists mm -hmm. the verbal skills. Because the whole key is if you go out and network with a plan, and you don't teach the dentist what to say to the patient to educate the patient to make sure they stay as a patient and that the difference between being in the plan being out of the plan isn't going to be that much money but right. i mean there, there's ways to communicate that right absolutely and that's why you know these plans to go um or these <laughs> these thoughts to go out of network are not like okay i made the decision and now we're going to do that next week i mean we like to prepare our practices to have a six month window of communication with the patient before the insurance company does. Because the minute you write your letter to the insurance company, that you bet your bottom dollar, they are gonna be communicating to those patients more aggressively than you are, telling them that this provider is no longer available to you and all, all of this other stuff that they like to put in there. So yeah. you've gotta give yourself time and empower that relationship with the patient. I think that's, one of the biggest things I see practices get in the trap of is they own the responsibility of the insurance. They don't put that back on the patient. And at the end of the day, that is not what you went to dental school for. It's not what you, why you opened a dental practice. It was not to manage insurance plans. So right. that's a whole shift. And a lot of times practices, whether they realize it or not, they've trained their patients on this. They've mm -hmm. trained them to say, mm -hmm. Oh, my dentist takes care of all of that. I don't need to know what my, my benefits carry. I don't know that it's not, you know, up to par. So that's a, a real reverse in psychology that we spend a lot of time on our teams that, doing. That's another webinar you and I are going to do down the road. <laughs> Sounds good. good okay. All right. Um, so moving right along, you know, when we took that whole notion of how do we make this the best year ever, there's uh, three ways that we typically grow a dental practice and we coach to exponential growth. And you know, a lot of people say, ask us all the time, is it really true that you can get double digit growth year after year, even with a practice that has been with you 10 years? And I look them in the eye and I say, absolutely. And it's this basic formula. It's more patients times more frequency times more per visit. And if you do the math on that, you know, if, you, if I grow it 10 times in more new patients and more frequency and more per visit, you've got 33% growth there. Um, conversely, if you added 20%, you're at 72% growth. So it's a, it's a neat concept and it works every single time. So, you know, we take that into consideration and that's when we're looking at you know, the mid-year review on the business plan for the next six months, all this has to be taken into consideration. You know, a lot of our practices are doing a ton of marketing right now. That was kind of the opposite. Everyone kind of shut down their marketing for, for a period of time. Uh, our practices hit the ground running with, you know, different, even mail campaigns. Mail have, has come back because people aren't getting a lot of mail, so they're seeing this stuff. So I do want to focus on, uh, you know, what we talked about at the beginning. We talked about the, the cash flow crisis maybe not being so much of an issue, but now let's talk about the patient flow and that phases of influence. So it really is kind of like a funnel. And that first aspect of the funnel to get patients in the funnel is that patient engagement. And there's really eight areas that you can engage with your patients. And 
the first one that you see on the screen, the culture calibration, this by far is the most important that I think most practices tend to neglect. Um, the culture and the team is really going to be your, that's your internal marketing. Those are the ones that are the people that are going to influence the patients to come back. And so getting your team on the same level and understanding, they're all on the same page, understanding that, hey, we came back and we had some fears, we had some uncertainty, but guess what? We've been back four or six weeks and things are great. Things have never been better. I've never felt safer. Our doctor stepped up. Our doctor's been an awesome leader. And these are the messages that people feel that. You don't even have to say anything. And when you walk into that dental office, people feel it. And so getting your culture really, really straight, really, really uh, in tuned and aligned is what's going to make all this other communication that much easier. So sending out emails, you know, it was really sad to see a couple of the surveys that said, you know, that doctors really hadn't been communicating with patients, let alone their employees. Yep. Um, that's just, you know, whether you did or you didn't, it doesn't matter, start now. Um, you know, emails need to be going out almost weekly and they need to be talking about the, your new safety protocols. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't get either from a, a hotel, a restaurant, a flight, or, or some airline that, that is telling me about their improved safety protocols. Well, dentistry should be no different. Um, texting, people are obviously on their phones so much more. Being able to text them and let them know that they are you know, do for an appointment and we need to see them. Uh, I believe that the email and the text need to come first before we do the phone call because I had one practice and they said, they thought they were doing all the right things. They just called and called and called and called. And I said, but the information that you are giving them is so factual and so heavy in all the sterilization protocols, they have to read it. You know, I think more than 60% of our, our uh, community is visual learners. And if you're trying to tell them about all these new protocols that you've put into place, it's going to be really hard for you to have an impact with them. As soon as they started to email them and have some text message conversations, the phone call was that much easier. So I do believe phone calls are really important, but in the right sequence. Um, yeah, go ahead, Art. That's like, that's like when the doctor... And you've seen this as a coach, Jennifer. Uh, the, the doctor goes ahead and they start telling the patient about the great impression material and all the occlusion and 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 and, and all the the um, you know how they're going to grind the teeth down and how it's going to work. They don't want you tell them that you're going to scare them. I mean, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. All the technicalities, yeah, not probably not scare. not entering their world in a very good way. Exactly. Um, you know, social, I think social has been a, uh, it can be a great friend to dental because I think if we're sharing the right messages um, about, you know, I, I, it's been overwhelming. We have been telling our, our doctors forever, like get testimonials, ask for reviews, right? Well, now the team is very motivated to do that and knows how important. And I mean, people are getting reviews right and left. And I think that also people are so connected to the small business and community efforts that they're willing to write the reviews. They're willing to do the patient testimonial videos, which I think is really, really neat. So something that all practices need to leverage. Uh, every, everything that I've ever seen, Jennifer, from marketing, and I've, we've had at our Academy of Dental CPA meetings, we've had marketing people, we've had them on blogs, we had them on webinars. It, a lot of this is all about five-star Google reviews. Yeah, because that's what people they look for a dentist. They're looking for how many, how many Google reviews are they five star? Looking at comments. I mean, you know, that, that's how the society is today. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't like when I was growing up when we had the yellow pages, <laughs> which you probably don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think I still use them for stools for my son. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I mean, all these points of engagement, like I said, mail has come back, you know, certain advertising, pay-per-click campaigns, and then the website. I think a lot of people have done a great job of updating their website. Um, you know, if my, if my dry cleaner down the street can update their hours and, and do things like that to maintain, I would expect the, the very most from, from the dentist as well. So all of these are your access points to your patients. And it's not, 
it's not enough to only do one of them. You really have to do all of them. Once we've actually then engaged the patient, now we're looking at how do we actually create that amazing patient experience. And we kind of outlined eight steps here as, as to five-star service. And, you know, really starts with that first impression. And we have to treat, I think you, are, you and I spoke about this, you really do have to treat every patient as if they were a new patient. Right. It's a really new process. And we know that. And feeling, even though they've been to the dentist hundreds of times, it feels foreign to them. You're meeting them in the parking lot. You're taking their temperature. You're asking them questions you've never asked them before. And that's all good from a technical standpoint. But what about the relationship? It all comes down to the relationship. Empathy, Jennifer. That is absolutely everybody. Everybody knows God forbid somebody who's been who who's gotten this horrible virus or who's died from this virus or who knows who somebody who knows somebody and and we're having to listen to everybody's stories and have empathy for them that's so important mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, so you know we really want to emphasize that first impression you know, practice and role play with your team. What does that look like? You know, I, I see in the picture here, someone's reaching out to shake their hand. That doesn't really happen anymore. You know, so what, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Um, you know, especially we talk about physiology. It's even more now because our, our masks are covered and our face is covered with these masks. And so it's really important to kind of go through and role play these these uh, steps of five-star service with your team because you shouldn't assume it's going to happen. Even if you were fantastic before, you had a kind of a blip in the radar that we've got to actually get back and calibrate all of this again. Um, so the first impression is really important. Next is the physical space. I've been going into dental offices more and more this month, and I'm seeing that you know they've taken – uh, wonderful waiting room chairs and they've stacked them up to the ceiling. Well, that isn't the most like engaging environment to walk into and look like the whole thing has been turned up on its head. So, you know, you've got to be cognizant of that. I know that the best of intentions, because you don't want them to stay there or they put yellow tape around the chairs or something, you still are in a service-based business where people are looking for that kind of stuff. And and people are going to be obviously flexible and they're going to be considerate of what's going on. But it doesn't mean that if we can do the smallest little things like finding somewhere else to put these chairs or making it look a little bit more appealing, uh, we want to do that. Um, third, you know, this was important before. It's even more important now. We used to tell all of our offices that, you know, make the new patient doctor call. So if you have a new patient that's coming to your office for the first time, spend the five minutes to give them a call on your way home and just ask them, hey, do you have any concerns for me? We're so excited to treat you in our, in our uh, dental family tomorrow. And if there's anything that we can do to make your visit more enjoyable, please let me know. And most of the time you're just gonna get a voicemail, but that you know, reaching out and that personal connection, it puts all of that anxiety and all of that fear that usually leads to cancellations and no-shows, it puts it to rest. Um, the other aspect that a lot of our offices are utilizing is teledentistry. So having a pre-appointment consultation via teledentistry has been really amazing. You get to meet the person, you get to connect with them and learn what their fears are in their normal environment. And so that's been really, really great. And you know, some of our practices that maybe aren't up at full capacity, they've got the time to do that. And some of our teammates that maybe were immunocompromised couldn't come back, they're doing these from home. You know? So you can think creatively on how to utilize maybe some best members of your team that have certain restrictions. Jennifer, are you recommending that we do this with new patients or with as many patients as we possibly can? Well, I think you definitely want, I think there's obviously there's a phone conversation with existing patients because you're doing kind of a pre-screening and you're, you're doing some communication building. So I don't know that it's as important with your existing patients, although, you know, it's a fantastic thing to do just to connect. One of the things we did actually over that 12 week period is we had our doctors commit to making uh, close to, I think it was 40 connections a week. And we did the math that they were able at in one month, they were able to basically reach almost, you know, all, all of their patients. 
And it didn't all have to be via phone. It could have been through text. It could have been through email. It could have been a little postcard. But that personal connection is so important. So if that's not something you did, you know, making a list of the patients that are going to be seen tomorrow that hasn't been seen in a while, it's important. But definitely a new emphasis on, on the new patients, for sure. Um, technology, we're finding, is more important now than ever. Uh, you know, if you, if you were great with CEREC or same-day dentistry before, you better be even better with it now. Um, patients want to be seen less, and you should want to see your patients less, you know? And, and so doing everything that they need in that one visit is really, really important. That's huge. It's, I mean, I, I've been talking to our doctors about that is what a great opportunity to use to, to explain to them how, how disease starts in the mouth and how we've got to strengthen your, like you and I talked on the phone about the immune system. And, 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 and if you said to a patient, listen, we can get all this done today because it's really Im- important for your total health. And I think patients would appreciate that, yeah. you know, so that's important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people, you know, before we would give, um, tours of our office we can't stop doing stuff like that they need to know the types of services that you offer they need to see the technology that's what validates the investment they're about to make in their health so that's really important Um, making sure this is more important than ever don't leave a patient alone Um, they already again have all this fear you look different Um, so making sure that you're you know just really keeping an eye on the patient at all times uh, anticipate. I think this is one of the things that really astounds me about really five-star service. If you go into a, a Michelin-rated restaurant or you stay in a five-star resort, the things you don't have to ask for that they anticipate you asking for. And if we can do that in a dental practice, well, that's what five-star service is. It shouldn't be just about meeting our expectations. It's about exceeding our expectations. And how we do that is by anticipating what the patient would need. Um, I mean, next. It's, it's, I was just going to say, it's, it's obvious you, you've got this down. Um, if any of you have looked at the Ritz Carlton chain, mm-hmm. they've got this down as good as, as well as any company in America as far as five star service. If you just Google what they do, you get some ideas, not on top yeah. of what Jennifer is telling you today. And a lot of this really, Kay, I studied the Ritz Carlton model in their, their academy. I mean, they would let, they would never when they're, I looked at that whole concept when you're training an employee and they don't let a new trainee speak to a customer for probably two months. And, you know, you think in dental, we just hire them and throw them in and sink or swim. Right. So (laughs) yeah, exactly. Um, This is one of my favorite ones. You know, everyone's familiar with the golden rule, which is do unto others as you'd want to be done unto yourself. And the platinum rule is really about flipping that around to say it's not always about what I want. It's about what they want. So asking them, you know, how do they want to be treated? And that's really important because at the end of the day, it's about them. It's not about us. That's what service is about. And I can't assume that everybody is going to do want it done my way. Um, so going above and beyond and just asking the patient what they really need from us as their healthcare provider is super important. I think that last impression too, you know, making a real personal connection, that handoff from, you know, the clinical team to the uh, admin team being really cognizant of what that interaction looks like, because that's going to be the determining factor of how soon they come back, uh, if they're coming back, and how many people are they going to tell to come to see you. So really, you know, accentuate that last impression. After we've gone through the uh, experience part, now it's really about the treatment acceptance, which again, a lot of our practices kind of were just being very reactive. They were being more emergency care dentists. They were treating whatever they had to, not really like the whole care of the patient. And, you know, in a CPA firm art, it would be like only waiting for the customer to come out and say, when's my tax return due? Instead of having periodic meetings about the health of their business and where they're going in trends, right? It's truly reactive versus proactive. And so we kind of did this, visual to say when patients walk into the office, it's your responsibility to meet the patient where they're at. 
And I don't mean physically, I mean really emotionally and mentally. So knowing where the patient is in their head and understanding what has gone on for them over the past two or three months. So some of the questions that we're asking patients is, you know, we've been asking patients about what's changed really for you over the last couple months. We know, you know, after talking to patients, we're seeing differences in employment and, you know, what they value. They've been spending more time with family. Tell me what specifically has changed for you over the last few months and let them talk, let them, you know, patients are saying all kinds of things, but it's not for us to assume what has changed in a patient's life. And I think as, as dentists, we do a really good job in the new patient, usually interviewed to, to kind of get a, a grasp on where our patients are, but then we don't do it ever again. And, you know, six months, three months go by and a lot has happened between now. So we've got to stop, pause, and really just take an interest in our patients. Oh my and God. Then, so yeah. And then more specifically, you can guide them. You know, they're going to tell you everything about what happened, their COVID related stories, but then drive them a little bit more specifically to is there anything that we, that you didn't need from us as a healthcare provider that you may need from us now? And again, pause and just let them tell you what they may or may not need. Um, this will help drive that personal connection, that personal relationship to really tailoring the conversation to what they want. I had a great uh, practice in Denver that said, gosh, we're having all these millennials come in asking for Invisalign. I don't know if they've been seeing the commercials or they've just been noticing in the mirror or their you know, uh, canines being turned or whatever. But people, young individuals are not going out as much. They weren't, you know, they didn't have high bar bills and restaurant going tabs. And so they've put some money aside. I know here in Silicon Valley, you know, we didn't lose a lot of unemployment necessarily because people were working from home, especially in the tech force. So, you know, we can't go in and assume that everyone's in a dire financial position. I think that would be really, really harmful for uh, the relationship with our patients as well as what it would do to our businesses. You know, um, not, not diagnosing their pocketbook. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And uh, we, we incorporated this really early on in our 90-day recovery, and I thought it was kind of neat. The actual Chinese symbols for crisis literally mean risk and opportunity. And every week we challenged our offices to really identify what is the one risk that's coming at you in your practice and what's the one opportunity. And to really focus on, you know, at the beginning, there were a lot more risks, it felt like, but now it, we see nothing but opportunity. And we hope that a lot of practices are focusing on that. Uh, we spoke a little bit about mergers and acquisitions. We think this is an unbelievable time for opportunity in that space. Um, you know, that's one of our secrets is how we're able to grow practices from a million dollars to two million and two million to four million is really uh, taking advantage of economy of scale and getting more providers under one roof. Um, so these are, you know, some of the things. I think the biggest risk, though, for, for all of this, if I put a bow on it, is just for doctors to be more reactive than proactive. If they sit back and they wait to see what happens, that will cause more harm to their business than if they were to do something and maybe it's the wrong thing, it's okay. We can, we can fix that. We can be more pro, we can do more with proactivity than we can with reactivity. So, so Jennifer, let, let's talk, a, I, I am by law required to talk about numbers because I'm a CPA, you know that, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so, I mean, you look at metrics. I know there's metrics programs out there. Do you use, and we don't have to mention names, you use a, I don't know if you have your own or use one of the yep. ones that are in the industry. But I mean, when I look at a when I when I look at it, I think anybody who doesn't use metrics and can go into their their Dentrex or their Eagle Soft or their Open Dental and, and look at it and say, wait a minute, I had a practice where we had thirty three hundred active patients, big practice, three doctors, and thirteen hundred of them who had been in in the last eighteen months were not scheduled for a future appointment, and 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 the average hygiene you know in the four thousand codes is like nine percent in this country, and I. And I'm talking to the doctors and I'm saying, you know, why are we not, why are we not looking at periodontal disease? Well, the hygienist, 
she she just doesn't believe in it. And I, I just want to like rip, take my hand through the phone and rip their head off. So so the numbers and the metrics are so, and it's what you and I have talked about, are so important. What are some of the actual, I mean, what, what are your, some of your KPIs that you, that you look at that, I mean, you look at a practice, a brand new client, and they say, uh, you know, oh, Jennifer, just nothing, something's right, it's not clicking, what, what, what are you looking at? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, that's something that we start off every relationship with a, a new client uh, asking is because we say, you know, diagnosis without examination is malpractice for the dentist. Well, it is for us as well. I can't tell you if I can help you if I don't know what's underneath the hood. And that's exactly what we do is, you know, I think there's, there's the metrics that you can read on paper that I think CPAs, financial institutions are, are great at reading. There's also the, the unwritten metrics, which is that culture piece that, that we look at as well. And on the financial side, you know, I'll give you one example is uh, you mentioned recare effectiveness rate is what we call it. And most practices, when we tell them, when we ask them, we said, do you know what your recare effectiveness rate is? They immediately go to pre-appointment. And I would hope everyone has 100% pre-appointment. They're scheduling before they leave, right? And so most of the practices will say, oh, it's 100%. Okay, great. But what a recare effectiveness rate is, is really looking at you, you've diagnosed a care cycle for your patient, whether it be three months for perio, four months or six months, you have a cycle that you have diagnosed them, you've prepared for them. And the idea is how many of your patients are actually sticking to that standard of care. And what happens is something happens from the moment that they're scheduled in the office to when they leave and don't come back until they're due again, let's call it six months, something happens in between that six months that sometimes pushes that appointment out to month seven, month eight, month nine, sometimes even month 12, where they think it's acceptable to come in every year instead of twice a year. And we're not tracking that. As dental providers, they're, they're not seeing those numbers. And that single-handedly can actually affect impact a practice that maybe was doing 700,000 and take it well over the million dollar mark because they're just not managing their standard of care appropriately. So those are types of numbers that we absolutely dive deep into to see where are all the opportunities. It's not just about uh, pointing out all the problems. It's where are we needing to focus on to actually uh, seek that opportunity and success. Right. And, and, and I have a lot of doctors who they, I, I try and get them to look at the numbers and well, our schedule is full and, you know, the, the front office person is handling all of this and, and not in this environment, not, not right. in this environment. And, right. and, and about marketing, how, how important now I, I, I recorded my, I do a weekly podcast as we've talked about, which you will ultimately be on um, with a, with a dear, dear friend who is a, actually a, um, a chief marketing officer, not, not a marketing company. And we were talking about how important marketing is today. And, and, and my, my, one of my you know, mentors in life taught me years ago that the day you stop marketing the business is the day you start, your business starts to die. So talk about what you do for marketing for your clients and how yeah, you- Yeah, I mean, marketing in its rawest form is communication art. And everything that we do is a form of marketing. I think there's a great book out there by Fred Joyle, Everything is Marketing, and it's so true. Yep. Um, and so, you know, our practices, while we have healthy ad spend budgets and marketing budgets, I think what a true test of a senior practice or a real seasoned practice thriving is that they don't spend a ton on marketing. It's just a part of everything that they do. And I, I touched on it a little bit, but I'll go back to it, that culture calibration and that internal marketing and the relationships that you're building with each and every patient and their ability to influence more patients to come to you is so vital. It is so critical to that practice's growth. And you know, there's a lot of companies out there that will analyze marketing efforts, right? And they'll do your call tracking and they'll see, you know, how many clicks you're getting and, and all this great stuff. And, and what I've found that with our practices, it's not as evident because we're not spending a ton to monitor what the ROI is. 
it's just coming a lot more naturally through patient engagement and the referrals of patients. And for years, I've always noticed it's like, it's not, it, getting them to ring the phone is absolutely number one or messaging us and getting us to book the appointment. But what happens afterwards, that's the most important. So, you know, we can look at a practice that had 300 new patients, but if they lost 500, they're down 200 right. and we're not growing that practice. So marketing is absolutely key. It's what gets them in the door, but what keeps them coming in the door is really, really important too. I, I want to make sure you cover everything you brought to the table there. We have about 10 minutes left. It, it, are you about at the end? Of I'm just slide? about done. Yeah, that was a, kind of the ending slide. And, and this, is, this is my ending slide, which is, you know, really, and I think you guys have done an amazing job as an organization is to be really proactive. You, you jumped on it right at the beginning to be able to support clients in an area that was completely foreign to them and all this PPP stuff. And so foreign to me, I tell you what, <laughs> I'm just making this stuff up as I go along, to be honest with you. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, you, you came from a place with really great intentions of how do I help? How do I serve? How do I support? And that's what we do as an organization. And I hope that everybody, you know, can make the world a little bit of a better place by just saying, you know, what can I do to help? And that's what the law of attraction is for me is whatever I give my attention, energy and focus to, I know will come back at me. And so if I am very fearful, if I am very living in scarcity and I'm just so worried about how I'm going to do, it's really going to be a reflection and it's not going to bring me what I want. And so the more they can kind of step into this proactive role in helping others and focus on the big picture, I really think good things come back to them. And I, I come back, is there a slide that has your contact information on there? Uh, I don't think. Okay. So if, oh, yes. There's... Oh, yeah, there it is. So oh, I forgot oh, that area. Jennifer, okay, so Jennifer, tell, because I, I again, folks, I don't, I don't promote the people I bring on my podcast or my webinar. That's, I, I don't need to because they're the best of the best like Jennifer is. So how would people, if they wanted to talk to somebody at Fortune and maybe look at what they're doing in their practice, maybe they got a late start and come back, how would they get a hold of you or somebody at your team? How would that work? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat box as well. Um, but our, our website is pretty extensive and is a great resource for the dental industry. That's fortunemgmt.com, um, fortune and the abbreviation for management, mgmt.com. So I've put that in the chat box. Hopefully people can see that. That is my email address as well. Um, but that would be the best way is to get to our website and then get a hold of us. We got, we have several, you know, like I said, 110 advisors all across the country that are more than willing to help people during this time. Uh, and maybe it is just getting an evaluation. We talk about it. We call it our practice analysis and opportunity assessment. It's completely complementary to any practice that just needs help actually finding those numbers and what they actually mean. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of that for practices because they're like, I don't need, I putting my head in the sand. I don't even know what I'm producing. I've got PPP money right now. I don't care. Oh. And oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will come to an end. So they do need help. Well, and again, I would encourage all of you to at least, you know, get in touch with Jennifer or one of their team members and just take a look at what you're doing and how you're doing. It. And the, the, the last thing I wanted to touch on was, and, and again, we get a lot of people who say, I need new patients. I need new patients. How many offices, Jennifer, do you and your team go into where you go, no, you don't need new patients. You've got $2 million of uncompleted treatment plans sitting in your computer What's going on with that? Talk about that for a second. I think that's really important. It's very true. I mean, we use the analogy. It's like this, the, the car owner that carries a case of oil in the back of the car because they said, you know, my car's great. It just needs more oil. It's burning oil. And so they just fill the, fill the oil can. And it's like, well, no, your practice is not great if all it needs is new patients. Uh, that means that you are not retaining the patients and you're not, you know, really, I think, taking each patient into that complete care that we were talking about, looking at, you know, not only just their needs, but their wants as well. And so we look at that all the time. I mean, we'll go into some rural area practices that have patient base of 10,000. And, you know, they haven't done the greatest job of keeping those records up to date, staying in connection with those patients. 
And so it's really, you know, when it comes to evaluating practices, that's a really key metric that needs to be observed and really cleaned up because, you know, that if I've seen plenty of practices that thought they were buying 7,000 charts and it came down to only a thousand of them had been seen in the last 18 months. Right. Well, I don't consider that a 7,000 chart practice. So, you know, those are your patients are so vitally important to the success of that practice. And so, yeah, it's not always about new patients. New patients are fantastic and they absolutely are important. But what I would say is the lifeblood of the practice is hygiene. Uh, For every, you know, dollar that's generated in hygiene, we see two to three dollars generated in restorative. So if you do not have a consistent and really well-performing hygiene department, you're not going to have a great practice. Um, and that's a, that's a concern when we go in and we see that a, you know, a, a practice has, a, you know, marginal uh, restorative and not so great of hygiene. The first thing we're going to focus on is the hygiene. And so it's not uncommon. We, we talk about million dollar hygiene departments. We, most of our offices are in that million dollar hygiene department. Wow. We really want to treat that as a business within a business. And, you know, some doctors will say, oh, I have, I have great hygienists. They just, they don't sell treatment. Well, I'd be willing to bet they're not a great hygienist. They're a good hygienist. And we need to get them as to being great enrollers of treatment. We don't use the word sell because I think selling is for people that buy things they don't want or need. Mm-hmm. Enrollment is allowing them the opportunity to actually get what they want. And, um, so that, you know, there's a big difference there, but hygiene is so important. So important. Hey, Megan and Scott, you want to unmute yourself, come back. I want to, if you guys feel bad that you were off the whole thing, (laughs) do you have any questions or comments about what Jennifer has has said? I mean, I think that she's a great resource in terms of being able to coach dental practices on, you know, how to not only come back, but to reframe their thinking from a surviving this to coming back and maybe being profitable and and really understanding that the team needs to be part of the conversations. I just think a lot of these are incredibly important points that a lot of dental practices should take advantage of if they haven't already. Right. Scott, any thoughts on, uh, on this stuff? I I feel bad. Some great information and also reminders too. Um, just one question. I've had a lot of clients dealing with the issues about bringing uh, employees back and key employees back. I, and I think it's a reoccurring issue and everyone's probably having the same challenges of, you know, they're scared to come back or, or for various other reasons. I, I, what are you guys suggesting for, suggesting for how, to, how to approach those conversations as folks are opening back up or having those challenges of, of bringing key employees back? That was, again, questions are the answers, right? So having that one-on-one conversation with each employee, this was something we were doing two, three weeks into the shutdown, is we had each owner have a one-on-one conversation with the employee and say, you know, where are you at right now? What do you need? You know, where, where, what's your childcare situation? What's your uh, spouse's employment situation? Are you okay? You know, that, that we get so much, so wrapped up in the, the facts that we forget about the feelings of, of the individual on the other line. And all of our teams that did that, all of our doctors that stayed in really quality communication with their employees to just say, what do you need right now? They came out the other side better and stronger and in a better relationship than they ever were. And it's interesting because we had a lot of employees that, um, also took the opportunity to retire early. You know, we had some individuals that just said, you know what, I've had a good run and and I'm good. And as long as we were in solid communication about it, it was fine. We were prepared. And I think that's where this divided energy happened between dentists and hygienists is we did not have healthy dialogue. We weren't asking what the other ones needed. And it was all about me, 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 and you know, how do I protect, how do I feel, all this stuff. And if people would just pause and try to be empathetic and try to really ask powerful questions, that's when the dialogue really was then constructive. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I think a lot of practices weren't as efficient as they could have been. And so it's important to know that as, at, at a looking at a level to be sustainable for long term, it was not appropriate for everyone to come back all at once. 
it was not appropriate for you know them to even think that they would be at the same levels right out the gate and so that's you know we had some staff members that said hey you know what i have a child care issue i'm okay holding back for right now or i'm okay doing some things from home or i'm okay on unemployment right now i actually prefer it so it, every situation was so varyingly different but what it came down to is that open and honest communication um, and the ones that, that did that, I think, really ended up with a better culture for it. Well, Miss Amy, I think we're at 1.30, right? Do I have two or three minutes that I can kind of sign off and everything? You have two, yes. Two minutes. Wow. One <laughs> year. By the way, first of all, I want to say to Scott and to all of the dads out there, happy Father's Day on Sunday. Um, that's, uh, you know. Wonderful day. It's usually the day that the U.S. Open golf tournament happens, and this year is different than any other. It will not be happening this year. Um, but uh, happy Father's Day, Scott. Happy Father's Day to you, to all the Thanks dads out there. Boys. Really appreciate it. And um, uh, Megan, thank you again. I can't overemphasize how amazing you've been to the Academy of Dental CPAs, to us, to I'd Bailey HMWC, and to all the dentists in America and all the things you guys at ADA are doing. Thank you, Scott. You know, thank you so much. If you have questions for your Ide Bailey uh, uh, dental expert or for me or for my team, you know, Pam Chamberlain, Don Watson, Sam William, we're here in Southern California to help you. Um, if you need to get a hold of um, Jennifer and her team and, and you know, you, you need that contact information, we'll get that for you. And folks, just keep doing what you're doing. And Jennifer, thank you. You are awesome. Thank you so much. That was yeah. outstanding outstanding information. We really, really appreciate it and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. And for everybody, again, same five words. Failure is not an option. That's what I've been saying since the beginning. It is not. And you can do better and you will do better and you need to, to, to do these things. And Amy, when's the next time we're going to see everybody? It's uh, July, right? July 5th, is it? Or uh, um, the exact date slips my mind but it's coming back up this summer yes all right sometime this summer we'll see all of you and we'll have some great information and questions on ppp or eidl or you know who's going to win the masters give us a call we'll, we'll be there for you so to to everybody jennifer megan scott thank you so much for everything really appreciate it and uh folks be safe have a great father's day and we'll see you next time bye-bye thanks everyone Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Amy.